going. Everyone is just joining. We're just going to give a couple more minutes for other folks to file in and then we'll get going. Mr. Forster, good to see you, sir. Greetings. I have been grieving the fact that we're not betting on ponies in a Catholic school basement. One of the many things COVID has taken from us. Next year in Jerusalem. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Let's see. Oh, 19th so far. Over expectation. That's great. It's a nice virtual turnout. Yes. Okay. Nate, do you have the breakout room button right now, just in case? I, I do. I have okay. a breakout room button. I don't know how it works. I don't, know what, <laughs> I don't know what would happen if I press it, but we got it. <laughs> well, it's good that learning is the uh, the topic tonight. So exactly. And if you're able to, um, you know, I'll just preface this with: I had some dental work today, so if I sound funny, that's why. Um, that's not what I wanted to say though. Uh, Brad wants to make this as interactive as possible. So I don't think he's gonna have a PowerPoint. So if you're able to turn your cameras on so you can see your smiling faces, if you're able to, if your hair's done and whatnot. <laughs> hey, Brad. Deb. <laughs> Now I'm nervous. <laughs> I've been speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see, we got 20 total on. It's coming up on five after. What do you say we get started in about a minute? I love it. Oh. A couple more popping in here in the waiting room. Okay, well, let's do it then. Uh, we're still recording, right? Checking all my buttons and levers, good. All right, so hi everyone. Welcome to, I think, uh, Product Tank Pittsburgh Zoom number three, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, so we're gonna do the, uh, for, for those who are uh, new, to product tank and even those who aren't you're here with us anyway we're going to do a quick you know five minute uh intro of what product tank is um oops, there's a few more coming in here uh and then really just turn it over to brad for those who aren't very familiar oh and you may want to disable the drawing feature nate i see some some lines on the screen oh i, I will some, figure that out and i see some grins in the zoom so all right <laughs> it's in there somewhere all right so I'm just going to take you through a real quick, um, you know, with our line on here, uh, intro of what Product Tank is. So Product Tank is an arm of Mind the Product. If you haven't seen that site, you know, and you work in the product world, you probably do since you're on this meetup. Uh, Mind the Product has been around for a little over 10 years based out of London. They're kind of a product advocacy organization. Uh, product Tank is an offshoot of that where, uh, you know, where they, they help organize, as do we, free meetups across the world. And I stole this on their website, I think the last time that we did one of these. There's over 200 now, which is pretty cool. Uh, Nate and I have been doing this one in Pittsburgh for a little over four years. Um, so it's great to see the, uh, the, the, the community really kind of grow. Um, if you work in product, and again, I'm sure you do in some fashion or another, uh, it can be kind of a lonely job if you know inside a single organization. So it's great to have these sort of uh, uh, meetings where we can get together in our local geographical areas. Heck, now with everything on Zoom, you can join uh, product tanks in other cities too. So it's cool to see that, that ability out there. Uh, how does it work? So, you know, I'm a product manager. Nate's a product manager. You're probably one too or, or close into that world. So, uh, you know, the, the, the organization is run by and for product management. But, and I actually have visual aid today. Uh, if you're familiar with Mind the Product, 
their logo is a little three circle Venn diagram. That, that's really intended to represent uh, the, the balance and the, the uh, connection between the UX world, the technology world, and the business world. So as, as most product managers or product marketing managers, you know, in Nate's case, tend to sit inside. Uh, and these meetings are pretty simplistic. We have a few different formats. Most of them are a speaker, as we're doing today. And, and, and as Nate said at the top of the meeting, this is going to be interactive. So, you know, toss your, uh, your camera on and get ready to, to talk with us. Um, a few things that are neat about the product tank or mind the product community, obviously, these meetups that we're having now. There's a few other things, too. I'll just go through these slides real quick. But there's uh, a Slack channel and some interesting things like conferences you can get into. There's public Slack on slack.mindtheproduct.com. If, you, if, you're, if after this meeting, you're interested in connecting with other, you know, like-minded product folks throughout the world. Um, there's a job board if you're looking or if you have a job to post. I actually just did this a couple of weeks ago myself. Uh, my company and Nate's company, when we work for Hospital IQ, we're hiring a product manager. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out there now. Uh, you you've, if you don't have access to my LinkedIn, uh, please hit me up there if you're interested uh, on hosp, hospiq.com as well as this job board. There's a posting for it. So we're looking for a uh, product manager with a few years experience to help run one of our newer product lines. And there are some great conferences too. Obviously, nothing happening in person these days. But the reason I, I keep this slide up is uh, there's some great video content on the Mind the Product website. If you're looking for something interesting to, to, to see uh, in these conferences that they've done, obviously the last one was virtual. They bring together a lot of product leaders um, throughout the world with a lot of different angles on the best way, the, the interesting ways to run and improve product management functions. Uh, so that's actually down there at that, that link that I, that I stuck in. Some great videos there if you're looking for a few minutes to kill. Uh, I'm not gonna sell you any of this. Mind the Product has, a, has some paid options that they have uh, uh, included now, if that's something you're down with. You can always sign up with them and uh, you know, obviously attend meetups, get their email digest. They have other stuff if you're interested. Again, not here to really talk much about that. Uh, Nate and I are, are, are product guys, a little bit about us. We both work for the same company. I'm a, I'm a director of product management at Hospital IQ. Nate's director of product marketing. Uh, we've been doing this, like I said, for a little more than four years. But uh, you know, our, our thoughts on product management are really kind of aligned with mind the product, and that sort of sort of modern way that moves away from uh, you know a little a little away from recs and specs, and a little more to uh, uh, empathy and learning with uh, with customers alike. So we have opinions. We're not going to inflict any of those on you today. But instead, we're going to tell you how you can get a hold of us, and then introduce Brad. So a few things. Um, if you signed up, you're probably familiar with the meetup page. We're not huge fans of meetup as a, as a platform. So we've set up on LinkedIn, just bought the product tank, pittsburgh.com domain that redirects to a LinkedIn group. Uh, there's a couple hundred folks on there now, I think. So if you have questions to share, if you have jobs to post, if you're looking for stuff, if you want to connect with your local product folks, that's a good place for it. We'll also post uh, videos on that and on our little uh, uh, YouTube channel here since we're recording the Zoom. Our sponsor is the Carnegie Mellon Master in Science and Product Management Program. Not a whole lot to sponsor these days being all Zoom, but uh, we're, we're grateful for that sponsorship. And a quick plug before we get started for our next meetup. So we, Nate and I were talking. Uh, we did this about a year and a half ago, but uh, we'd like to put this out to you, the membership. So we had a great time a little while ago recruiting some lightning speakers from the membership roles. Uh, the, way we, we, the way we did it in the past was just to recruit three or four, you know, 10 to 15 minutes a piece. Maybe you even have a presentation in your pocket that, uh, that could be useful for this. But really just like, you know, just like all things product management, it's all about solving problems. So we'd love to hear from the membership how you solved an interesting problem at work. Maybe it was COVID related. Maybe you're drawing on the screen like Nate is. Both problems to solve. Um, so, you know, if, if you're interested in that, uh, we'll post it later in, in the LinkedIn page at producttankpittsburgh.com. But, uh, you know, hit us up. Uh, through Meetup, through email, through LinkedIn, or post on that and that LinkedIn group. We'd love to hear from you. So we'll be you know, recruiting a little more actively for our next uh, get together. So that's enough of me. Um, I'd like to introduce Brad Ivan. He's the interim executive director of the Carnegie Mellon MSPM program. So we're really excited to have him on and talk about uh, Mr. Miyagi's way toward innovation and continuous improvement. Brad, take it away. Thanks, John. And just a kind of a side note to what you just presented. Um, I'm going to present several problems today. So that might be a good lead into your next meeting uh, for those 
paying attention, taking notes, and sort of putting the discussion into action. Uh, as you can see, I'm committed to the, I'm broadcasting from my home dojo here, my COVID dojo. I'm committed to the Mr. Miyagi theme tonight and um, to a fault, actually. I'd like to start with some interaction and hopefully loosen everybody up, break some ice and sort of get people thinking in terms of opening our minds toward viewing problems as opportunities to learn. With that in mind, and there's a rhyme to this reason or a reason to this rhyme, I'd like everybody to sort of share what your least favorite job interview question is. There's one that I'm looking for and there's a reason why. In the chat, you can chime in. What, 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 are, the, what are the most annoying job interview questions that you come across? How about what's your biggest strength or weakness? Oh, that's a good one. That's not the one I'm looking for. We have uh, Jason Bresh says, tell me about yourself. Jeremy, Gerald, you hit the nail on the head. It's where do you see yourself in five years? And I'm using that as the platform. That's, that's actually the platform when Nate asked me to speak tonight, the platform that I wanted to leap from. I've always hated the where do you see yourself in five years question, even from the time that I graduated, for several reasons. One reason is it's almost inherently insincere, an insincere setup for the person responding in the sense that there's so much happening in the next five years that you can't possibly accurately see yourself somewhere. The second is the, the more problematic aspect of that question and the one that I want to flip tonight for us. And it's, it's the idea that seeing yourself somewhere in five years implies that it's going to happen to you. It's, it, it, it always felt to me like a passive question, like, oh, I will be the director of product or something along those lines in five years, where it's not something that you are doing, it's something that is being done to you. So with that in mind, and when Nate asked me to present tonight, I considered what is the single most universal and important topic that I could cover. And that topic is that of learning, that of developing, that of acquiring skills. And the better way to think about that question in my mind is, who are you going to be in five years? not where do you see yourself. It's, it's, it's an act, action-based, action-oriented way to look at that question. And we'll talk tonight about how to execute, how to identify those opportunities for yourself and then for those on your team who you may coach and then how that blossoms into a corporate culture, a, a, product team culture, whatever your environment is, whatever your team unit is, you can, build the, you can build that out by starting with yourself, expanding outward, and making it the norm, making it the way. And the reason why this strikes me as the single most important topic that we can talk about is not only is it universal, but it's the same topic that I'm concerned with when I talk, interact with my own kids, with students, it's always been the fundamental relationship I've tried to build with my team in various settings and regardless of what the hierarchical positions have been. So really learning to use design thinking, learning to use lean thinking, in a way that helps you design learning processes for continuous learning as a way of life is to me the, the thing that I wanted to cover today. And as it relates to the, the way that will work, I hope tonight to show something that looks like a framework that is adaptable, that you can master yourself, you can at least consider as you're progressing. Um, and that you can also take and adapt. And I'll, it's something that I've 
worked on for years and arguably decades, the, the whole assessment and the iteration and trying to refine something that works for me, I'll talk through how that developed and some of the specific steps that I've seen work in many different areas. And a bit of, a bit of background as to why, why I chose Miyagi as the sort of the, the theme tonight is on one hand, I had just finished when Nate asked, I had just finished watching an entire season with my daughter. But beyond that, I do have a Miyagi story. And my story starts when I graduated from Pitt. I started working in Kentucky at Toyota Motor Manufacturing. And at that time, I'm a young engineer. And imagine yourself in these shoes. I'm trying to prove myself. I'm trying to tackle my first project like a maniac. I'm in the middle, essentially my, my second project in this case was to write a three quarter million dollar proposal and take it through the ranks and get approvals up through the, the general manager role. And really being as new as I was less than a year, I had no business asking for three quarters of a million dollars or even presenting presenting what that plan would look like. But that was all the more motivation. So I, 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 I took this thing and I, I gave everything I had to understanding the data, understanding the justification, understanding the history, the cost savings up, uh, opportunities, all these things. I put them together and I put them into this report. And at, in those days, and maybe still the case now, for every American manager at Toyota, there was also a Japanese manager. And I, I took it, I took the report to my own manager and then my Japanese equivalent. And then we took it up to director level and I got it signed by the American director. And it was my turn to review it with the Japanese director. And this report, I, I knew all the data back and forth. I, I knew that it was bulletproof. There was no way that he was gonna reject it because it was just, it was so much went into getting it right. I sat down with the guy, set it in front of him. And he looked at it for a second, sort of turned his head, pointed to me and goes, it needs to be beautiful. This is a three quarter of a million dollar business report. And his feedback to me was it needs to be beautiful. Now that, Probably, I, I don't even remember what I was thinking at the time. I was probably too stunned by this, this result to even process what I just heard. But I put all these hours, all this effort, all my heart and soul into this report and sit down for review. And the response is it needs to be beautiful. Now, the takeaway after sort of processing what I just experienced was I'm gonna make it beautiful. I'm going to use more attractive, aesthetically pleasing graphics. I'm going to arrange the information in a more visual manner, in a way that is more, more pleasing to the eye and easier to process and take it back to them. Long story short, it, it was approved and went forward, but I had not forgotten that lesson. And the lesson, much like the, the for those familiar with Karate Kid, the wax on, wax off, off lesson, is that there was a skill that I, I thought I knew everything. I, I, I was new, I, I thought I had everything under control. I was self-righteous and all this stuff. But there was a skill, there was a way of doing things, a way of communicating within the organization that was so important that he was ready to reject all this work that I did so that I could learn this lesson and it became a thing that I've not only adopted and tried to work into everything that I do, and I've taken it to other companies, I've taken that whole idea, got me through my career at Toyota and through careers at other, other I've worked at MSA for those in Pittsburgh and um, other places. But when I process and when I look at it from a leadership position, he could have just signed it and been done with it. But 
that would not have benefited me. And that would not have benefited his organization because this lesson was necessary. It was something that instantly made me a better engineer. And um, no one is grateful for that kind of feedback at the time, but it's the type of thing that I think about when I think about continuously trying to learn in every situation and adapt learnings to situations where uh, opportunity to create opportunities to learn in areas where they may not otherwise be apparent. So this is important to me. This is this is the thing that I'd like to share, or at least at least provide some back and forth as far as um, tips or ways of going about doing this stuff. Um, the reason that the the reason that I am so passionate about this topic is because I kind of learned as as I as I progressed and I became a manager and a director. Um, the the uh, the the idea was that I found the most fulfilling aspects of my role to be that of mentor, to be the area where you're coaching somebody else to learn, you're coaching somebody else to solve problems rather than solving problems for them. So as I mentioned, I, I, about me, I started at Toyota, I started as an engineer, I learned the Toyota way, and I'm gonna to talk tonight about how the Toyota way and lean thinking and design thinking can help us create this culture, both individually and uh, corporate. And um, that ultimately led to teaching, which ultimately led to currently directing the program, the MSPM program at CMU. So that's a little bit about my background and kind of why this is important to me and what we're aiming for tonight. Um, we're going to talk about going through this process with yourself as the user, essentially, with yourself as the person who is learning and measuring their own their own um, their own their own results, and then that of that of how to coach other people through the process. So, with that in mind. Um, I think this is something that is universal. This is something that applies regardless of function, regardless of title, and something that we can interact with as we progress. So I'm going to pull into place. Rather than walk through a PowerPoint presentation, I thought we would interact with the whiteboard a bit. And is that is that visible pretty well? Yeah, I think so. Okay, Thanks. excellent, excellent. So on the journey of learning, on the journey of understanding a new picking up a new skill or mastering something that perhaps you struggled with. The most important aspect, of course, or the starting aspect anyway, is to understand why it's important to you because you are going to need to anchor yourself in that. And without, without anchoring yourself in why and to kind of borrow Simon Sinek's graphic there of start with why. Without starting with why, you will lose motivation to stick with it. And the idea is that, take New Year's resolutions, for example. If you have struggled to keep your resolution, if you have struggled to to even 
bother to make a resolution because you knew that you wouldn't stick to it. If it's failed already, most likely you failed here. And why? Why is this important to you? Why, how does it fit into your life? And we'll start with a technique that I've used and I've used with other people to identify what it is that is worth learning, what it is that is worth, what skills are worth picking up. One way to do that in a way that works extremely well with um, your team members, especially, especially if they're more junior, is to start with what Excel calls a radar diagram, what I, I've, I've called a spider diagram. And the way that this works is to visually map out different areas of your life or different areas, different skills that you may um, find to be necessary within the course of your professional role. So there's two ways that I would look at this. One is, one is how does, how balanced is my life compared to where I'd like it to be? You could do it on a holistic, big picture, macro level, or you could do it as I'm a product manager or I'm a, an engineer who's a aspiring product manager. What skills do I need to develop and what skills are important to making it to the next level or where do I stand now? And if I want to become a product manager, what do I need to work on? Um, for example, the way that this would work, like let's say, um, let's say a, a software engineer wants to become a product manager. This might look something like marketing skill. And maybe this is tech and maybe design. And the way that it would work is you would sit down, assess yourself honestly and judge out of, you know, whatever the scale is, let's say zero to 10. Right now I'm, I'm at about a five here and I'm at about a two here and I'm a 10 here. And you would connect these dots. And in order to understand where you are going or what your aim is, you might know what it takes to become that next level product manager or director or something else. And you would chart that out the same way. And when you see a gap, you know that that's a skill you need to acquire. And this is a good way to use in two manners. One is I, I use it for myself to identify what do I wanna work on next? Is it, um, is it, is it uh, negotiation? Is it uh, presentation? Is it something else? Um, so understanding where my own gaps are is one way that I can use this. I've also used this a lot with my team members in such a way that I'll sit down with them in our one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. And this is kind of the start of our, our developmental discussion. This is the start of us talking about where do we want to, where do we want you to progress to? And what do you think is important? Because if they start filling in, if they start filling in the categories themselves, now you understand how they view the important aspects of their job or how they view what they need to accomplish. And you can begin that as a negotiation. You can start to talk about, you can start to talk about, well, you know, for the next level, for your progression, it's not really that important that you understand design. It's something else is important or um, really go back and forth. It enables a lot of discussion and a lot of progress tracking in terms of um, routine meetings, in terms of establishing action plans. And you can do this even in, in you can do this. You can also use mind maps as ways to establish, establish training plans and development plans in such a way that Let's talk about, you know, everybody's kind of familiar with the, the typical Venn diagram for a product manager. You know, let's say this is tech and this is business and this is design. Um, out of these branches, what aspects, let, let's, let's start to 
create a visual image for the, the person that you're coaching or even yourself. I've done it myself. I've done similar things myself in creating as I was, as I've been sort of applying for jobs and preparing my own, my own developmental plans. I've done this so that I can identify and I can visualize this is an area I need to work on, or this is, this is a branch that I need to work on. And then you can even take the spider chart and overlay it and have, have basically a mind map of spider charts that kind of show you, I want to work on my health over here and I want to work on my professional over here in a way that you can combine these in such a way that you can visualize and start to sprawl out in a visual manner how you intend to go begin identifying those areas for opportunity. Um, so this, this, as a starting point, I found to be extremely successful and very easy for younger engineers, younger, newer grads to, to absorb and to understand and to take ownership of their own, their own, their own development. And it, as they work on it themselves and as you coach them through it, it becomes something that they have ownership of, they have pride in, and it becomes something, even just the idea of working on a visual image on a, in a back and forth one-on-one -on -one manner allows a, an engineer or a, a younger product manager or you know, something along those lines to, to know, and you're working off the same page in, in terms of smooth communication as far as what needs to be worked upon. So this is one that if there's anybody that sort of feels like you're stale or feels like you might have plateaued or you haven't moved forward recently, I, I, I strongly suggest sitting down like this would be a very good starting point for just understanding where, where you want to work. And other ways that I've used this is as I'm sort of thinking through the different categories or the different attributes that I need to assess myself against. This also turns into a good way if you're keeping a, a notebook of your own progress or if you're keeping your own developmental notes in a, and this goes individually and for teams as well. If you're keeping your own developmental notes, you can collect them in a place like OneNote and then each category becomes its own, its own tab. And it, it sets you up to really visualize and interact with your own plans and those plans of your team. And it also, it also sets you up for establishing business plans as a result too. But that's, that's a little bit outside our scope. But the idea, once you've figured, once you've motivated yourself to want to learn something, um, or once you have convinced or persuaded your team that there's something to learn either as a group or individually, um, these are good starting points to identify where to work. Next is sort of designing, designing the game plan. And I showed a couple of the, of the design frameworks here, the, the Norman Nielsen, um, version with the, excuse me, the different, the different loops and then the iterations and everything. But I, I chose to show theirs because it starts with empathy. And as you embark, as you start to identify areas that need work and as you embark upon them, you need to have empathy for both yourself if you are focusing on your own development and you need to have empathy for your team if you're coaching others in such a way that, like the example I'll use is recently, not, not right now, but my previous role required about two hours per day of commute. And it, I was spending about 10 hours per day at work. So 12 hours total per day, not counting overtime and all this other stuff. So 
if I'm looking at ways to improve myself and I'm doing that with empathy for my situation, I know that I'm not going to come home and read books for four hours a day, that it's just not going to happen. And given that situation that I'm in and the, the same can be applied to, to your team in such a way that, um, understanding either what their goals are or why they're struggling or have been struggling or haven't made progress in their goals. I've found, and I don't think this is an abnormality, I've found that most people who haven't made learning and made progression and acquisition of skills, most people who haven't made that a priority have not known that it's even available to them. They, they either have some mental block that makes them think that I've plateaued and this is where I'm gonna end up, or they believe that the safe way to exist is to do exactly what the boss says, no more, no less, and just sneak away at the end of the day. Um, the, the greatest successes I've had in coaching situations were with people that did not have any real reason to believe that they, that their their potential was what it was. Um, one one person specifically was kind of uh, th this. Th this is um, just an excellent story of an excellent person who um, had never been introduced to the idea that he had an opportunity to improve himself. He had an opportunity to improve his position. He was kind of kind of, he had been in our organization for a while, had kind of butted heads with past management. And it was, it was, it was very much a, a managed, a, a, a micromanagement, you know, do exactly what we say and don't ask too many questions situation. So when I, when I started working with him, he just kind of had been, you might say embittered or had given up on really understanding what it was that he could accomplish. And I, I, he, had, he had earned that reputation too. It was kind of a reputation of someone that had given up or had, you know, was just there to kind of grumble and make it through the day. But I observed him and I observed that when he was in certain situations, he was an absolute pro. He, was, he had these skills and he had a desire to do the right thing. And he didn't believe that there was a way forward for him. So just empathizing with understanding. So let's talk about why you acted this way in the search of this situation, because I've seen you act much more professionally in other situations. This guy, he specifically went from being an hourly worker to our best project manager at the company that I was at. So like th this, this, there's a lot of people, if you're, if you're in an organization with employees or with product teams, there's almost certainly people that don't necessarily believe, unless you're out front about the idea, there's almost certainly people that don't believe that they can move forward. And understanding that and having those one-on-one -on -one discussions is super critical to move forward with them. And then, once, once you've kind of identified what to work on, once you've identified what the starting point is, what the emotional readiness is, um, what the level of willingness and tenacity and all these things are, then sit down and consider the problem in such a way that you're considering multiple solutions. If you want your resolution to stick, if you want your improvement effort to continue Oh, through obstacles, then understanding that there's potentially more than one answer is critical. It, just like in, in the design process, it's no different to design the process for learning something new than it is to design a product itself as it relates to that. And then most people can get this far. I've pretty much come to see in, in various forms it's when you get to actually measuring the, the results and doing something about it and understanding 
the uh, the the chart here. It, it's um, this is taken from the the Toyota production system, and it's two types of improvement. One is continuous improvement. That's the green chart, slow progression over time. And then one is called what they that's what they call kaizen in Japanese terminology. Then one is kaikaku, basically an innovative step forward. Um, I'll. I'll tell you in keeping with the kind of Miyagi theme tonight, one of, one of the things that I have taken on as a learning effort was when I tried and started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And if you look through the process up to this point, I started Jiu Jitsu maybe eight years ago. And for those that aren't aware, Jiu Jitsu is physically grueling, it's physically punishing, it's, it's, uh, it's, the practices are pretty much live sparring each time. And when I look back at why did I do it, if I didn't have a strong why, I'd have given up at the first class. And that's what you see people do. Um, and I had, I had reasons for why I entered it. And most of them were health related. It was also a good chance for me to pick up a, a, an activity with my son. So if I were to look at all the gaps that I had at that time, jujitsu filled a lot of them because it was something that I wanted to do for multiple reasons. And it, it, it gave me, it gave me the opportunity to do that. So I got, I get down to, okay, I've chosen, I've chosen my design approach. I have my plan. What was surprising. And this, this is one of the things to consider as you're learning anything or as you're learning multiple things is are you learning something that will be an incremental improvement or are you learning something that's gonna revolutionize your life? And you might say something like time management is something that you'll probably see incremental improvement. You'll, you'll get an extra hour. If you learn to manage your time, if you learn the techniques, you'll get an extra half an hour here, an hour there, a couple hours a week. Um, you'll probably get incremental improvement as you learn better techniques and refine them. And then other completely different skills, generally those, those that are most uncomfortable are the ones where you'll make the biggest steps. When I, when I started learning jujitsu, I expected incremental, just physical improvement and you know, some, some basic minor, minor improvements in a general sense. What I didn't realize was the crossover value of learning something new and learning something scary learning something completely outside my comfort zone. I, I got to a point where I, it changed the entire way that I look at interactions with my team and with my supervisors and anybody, anybody that I need to negotiate with rather than like when I, when I tell my story about my Miyagi story and I had all this data and I had all this logic and I was ready to push it through. Um, the, the way that I've learned to do that is to use the momentum of whomever I'm interacting with. So um, I literally took this physical skill and made it a tactical, tactical skill in my day-to-day -day interactions. And I didn't expect that. That's not even something I was aiming for. But as I stuck with it and as I learned to learn the art and I learned the mentality behind it, I was getting multiple, I was getting way more value than I ever imagined um, in a completely different area of life. And I think there's a lot to be said with whatever, the, whatever that stepping out on that ledge and whatever taking that step out of your comfort zone, like right now, with our students, we, we've identified that historically some of the less, some of the more introverted students will be passive in their team courses and they'll be less likely to speak up, but no less competent and no less able to generate good ideas and um, no less skilled at the product management tasks or the, the areas within product management. What they lack though is that, 
push into their zone of discomfort. One of the things, so getting back to the idea of translating skills, one of the ideas that we've learned from our, our HCI program partners is they've used improv activities as a way to, as a way to increase that skill in a way that um, maybe as the students are going through it, they don't realize what they're actually learning in the process, but they're not learning to be comedians or improv actors. What they're learning to do is be comfortable in the spotlight. And by the same token, they, those students who are too outspoken, those who, those who are the kind that the type that generally dominate discussions and dominate team meetings, they can learn to step back, step out of the spotlight and elevate their teammates. Um, so part of, part of what to look for in your own learning activities and efforts, and especially those for your team and your company are, are there opportunities to essentially cross train or to, to develop skills in unconditional ways that then come back and add to the overall team output. That's just one example, but um, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways to identify outside of your typical work environment, how to improve the performance and the, the, the confidence, especially of team members that can be byproducts, but it actually ends up turning into the, the most important aspect. So in the, in the ongoing effort to innovate, to continuously improve, to learn so that you can do those two things, the thing that I always see and the thing that I think is absolutely the most critical is understanding what happens when you run into an obstacle and understanding how to react when you run into an obstacle, because it will. And it gets back to why is it important to you? But really, most companies, most people, most organizations really don't have either the, the tenacity or the process in place to react, to understand why this obstacle occurred and why did, why did we lose our momentum? Why did we stop having our one-on-one -on -one meetings? Why did we stop those daily standups in which we were all on the same page and then now no one knows what anyone else is doing? Um, those types of things really rarely get the attention or the problem solving approach because most people don't track their progress with intention, especially if you're doing this on your own. I would argue, uh, I would venture to bet and maybe maybe a show of hands. Can, can we get a, a show of hands or just kind of a, if you should have a raised hand button. How many people in the audience have either already failed, well, maybe, how many people in the audience are keeping a 2021 uh, resolution right now? Oh, good for you guys. So, and part of, part of the reason why there's few success stories with resolutions is you either don't have a strong enough anchor, or even if you do, you're not tracking your results. And that's mostly what I mean by approaching the learning process with intent and doing this all intentionally and with tracking and with, with plan, do, check, act mentality. So like one of the things I've been working on unsuccessfully, I might add personally, is time management, especially time management as it relates to getting non-work stuff done. So I, I've looked at my own process. I've looked at my own, my own failings and it's something that I'm working on right now. I would consider it I wouldn't consider it a failed resolution. I'd consider it a resolution in process. But the idea is um, 
So one of the things I wanted to do was get enough sleep every night and wake up at 5.30 so that I can work out and do the other things so that I can go to work and not have to worry about all the other things. Um, and some may or may not be familiar with the 5 Y methodology, but this started as part of the Toyota production system and it's made its way into um, the discovery side of, of product management. But what it, what it essentially is for anybody unfamiliar is the idea that if you failed at something or if you need to understand what happens, what happens in terms of, uh, in terms of how a process broke down, you ask why, but that's probably not the real reason. That's probably the surface level reason. Then you ask why that thing happened and why that thing happened. And the, the idea, the general idea is you ask five, why five times and you've gotten to the root of the problem. For me, I want to, I want to get adequate sleep. I want to wake up early and get all my stuff done. Well, why can't I wake up early? In part, this goes back to the empathy because me at 5 30 AM is not me at 10 PM. The, the me that decides when to go to sleep is not the same in the same mindset as the one that needs to wake up in the morning. So why is that? Because the me at night, is still working or doing something else and isn't concerned with going to bed. Well, how, why is that? Because I got too much stuff to do because I got woke up late the night, the day before and didn't get other things done. So digging back into what the root of these things are, um, like for this one, for example, what I found is it's not waking up in the morning. It's, it's setting an alarm actually to go to bed because I will just ignore the clock at night. And I've, I, through empathizing with myself, through sort of iterating this process and tracking what works and what doesn't, I found that I can't trust myself right now unless I force, unless I set up processes that force me to get into bed, that gets me up in the morning. And then to boot, I have like alarms all over the house that will go off at the same time and have to run around or I'll wake up the whole house. So like I, I've learned, I've learned through assessing the five whys, how to, how to overcome my own deficiencies in, in a regard like that. And the other aspect is the Deming cycle, the plan, do, check, act, which kind of applies to the whole thing, but it really, I find that, especially as a leader for those who are managers, directors, or above, um, I find that without your influence, without having something regularly scheduled, that most people get too tied up in their own tasks to, to insist that they follow up on their developmental and their learning and their skill acquisition tasks. So I, I think it's really important. I found it to be really important that as, as the team lead, as the product team lead, as, as the manager, as the director, that you insist that with every discussion, with every review, there's a follow-up and it's a, a follow-up with a, a, a legitimate frequency depending on what is being discussed or what is being um, worked upon by, by those in your team. And to make sure that as you're going through your day-to-day -day, that you're blending the, the work assignments and the project assignments with those tasks that align with the team's develop, personal developmental goals. Because that really, more than anything, if you sit down, if you have a new team, if you have a new worker within the team or something, and you start on day one and say, hey, we're, we're going to do what we need to do. We're going to do what we need to, to get the task done, to get the job done, to, to build the product the right way but we're also going to make it a priority that it is going to be my priority that we understand what your personal developmental goals are and that we work toward them. That type of bluntness and that type of directness in terms of showing your own interest in the development of those around you, I found it to be the most, the most culturally impacting aspect of any place I've worked. It, it, it was in the air at Toyota. It's the thing that Toyota is known for. And 
it's it's also the thing that to the extent that I can, I've tried to take from Toyota and implement everywhere else. Um, because it's really, it, it's if people can rally around the idea that they trust that you're in it for their best development in the long term, for who they will become in five years, not where they envision themselves, that's the most important thing that I, I think that I've ever seen in terms of effectiveness, effectiveness uh, in building culture. That was long winded, is not as interactive as I. I had hoped, but um, are there any thoughts, any questions, anything that I either s skipped over too fast, didn't cover, might have missed any tips that you guys have, any of these tactics that you guys have tried that have worked or you've, you've adapted or anything like that? I've got kind of a, maybe a softer question than that. So I loved what you said about you know, uh, and, and I'm looking at the left side of the of the whiteboard there, measuring yourself and, and, and holding yourself to to a standard. How do you how do you do that? How do you make that measurement? Importantly, I think you said this check in with yourself later. How do you do that while kind of remaining remaining kind to yourself? You, you mentioned talking about, you know, uh, uh, resolutions that last you know, don't last long. How do you how do you how do you how do you bring yourself back from that if you're not quite meeting the goals you're setting out? To yourself? I, I really like that question, Sean, and I think that comes back to 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 these two items. And if you can ask if you can ask yourself why this failure occurred or um, what got in the way, and how can I ensure that the next attempt doesn't? If you can do that in a stoic manner, if you can do that detached. From, from your own self, self dis, disappointment in yourself. And if you can do that, oh, I, it's one of the reasons I find that writing it down helps, keeping a notebook, because if you're writing, you know, if you're writing a performance review for a subordinate or a team member, and you're not doing it in such a way that you like feel your own personal, personal self being attacked, so if you can look at from a detached mindset, and this is part of, this is part of understanding why, because if, if you can embark on whatever it is you're going to learn, and if you can do that in a way that I know that I'm not going to be any good at it, I know that it'll take 20 tries before I get it right, but I'm in it for that, with, with that as an expectation, and I'm not going to beat myself up because it's February 3rd and I've already given up on my, my, you know, weight loss goals or whatever the thing might be. Um, the, uh, the whole idea that you're looking at this with an analytical mindset and you're, you're trying to set the process up for yourself to succeed the same way you would for someone else. I really like that question. I like that answer. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. I had a question. I had a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, Randy. Yeah, you had uh, talked about when you did that proposal for Toyota, it was, it was kind of rejected because it wasn't beautiful. I guess what would have made it beautiful? <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that, that's a funny question because he never told me. Um, he, I don't know if this was some like Jedi mind trick thing or what, but um, I had to go figure that out and I had to go benchmark other reports and I had to sort of ask around and get second opinions and all that kind of stuff. But it really was an eye of the beholder type thing. But what I came to find out as well is that because, and this is not a secret, this is not, this is not negative in any way, but because it's a Japanese company, when you get to the higher level presentations, they're generally more comfortable with fewer English words. So you'll see a lot of very high level presentations that have very little text and things are illustrated in a manner like this. Um, like th th it, if, I, if this was all written out, you know, the whole script and that would be less beautiful in, in, that, in that sense. And like, for example, one of the last presentations I ever gave at Toyota, 
was a wall size poster like this. And it was, it was an executive walkthrough of our shop and it had three English words on it, but it told the whole story otherwise. And that, like, that was what they considered beautiful. And that was part of the learning experience. But the real learning experience was that's kind of universal. People don't want to read a bunch of text. People do want to get easy to digest graphics. And um, it's, it's kind of, you know, like minimalist UI design in that sense. It's really the same principles when you talk about what he was teaching me and what we're teaching designers to make interfaces look like. You're on mute, Randy. So let me restate that. So you went off and produced something on your own. The real learning was to kind of understand what was accepted, more accepted in the organization. In that case, but also what, what was... And why? Yeah, and also what to, to understand that what was accepted was very simplistic, effective, direct communication. Hey, Brad, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, so in, I've been with the same company for a while now, and I was a manager leading a team of about seven or eight people, and I've moved on to a PM role and not managing anymore. But one of the, the things that I really felt was important was a lot of what you talked about. It was about, you know, setting goals and uh, with your team and having them understand what goal they wanted to hit and then how to get there. So the company did a lot of stuff for them. They funded Udemy courses for them and gave them like half hour a day to make sure they were working on it. But there were just so many excuses at the end of it that said, oh, I don't have time to do this. But like we paid for this stuff for you and you're just not doing it. So how do you get people to invest in themselves if you're giving them all the tools and then they just say, oh, I'm too busy for this? That's, <laughs> that's th there's two ways to look at that, that question. One is whether that person is truly motivated to improve um, or to learn something new or to expand their own skills. Let's, let's start with the assumption that they're not because this is a mistake I made as I progressed. I, I've started out at organizations in which I came in on day one and I, I pretty much made it entirely clear that self-improvement, continuous learning is the standard, it is the expectation. But what I found was by setting an, an expectation like that, I'm burning a lot of calories on a lot of people that just have zero motivation to learn. So there's, that's one side of the coin is, it's kind of like the old joke that how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but it needs to want to change, right? So, so if you have people that I'm only three years from retirement and I don't really care, I'm just riding it out, you're, you're, you're wasting calories and wasting energy and wasting time on them. When, if you have people that are motivated, but they're so motivated that they're spending all their time working on tasks, working on projects and product work and all these things that are direct output, it becomes the manager's responsibility to set that expectation, to set time aside. And to the extent that you can, combine that time, double up on that time, make it, make it both production and um, product talk time, but at the same time, you're discussing their improvement initiatives. Like it doesn't, what I'm saying, I guess, is if the time that is required for a class in this case, or, or paid resources is too much of a commitment, then start working it, working these discussions into your, your routine discussions. One thing that I've done in the past is I've had situations like this where everybody's just busy like crazy, but at some point we still need to have our one-on-ones and check in and say, hey, how are things going? Or how overloaded are you? Or what's suffering? But there are ways to minimize the, minimize the amount of time invested in the learning itself and make it efficient. One thing that I've done, for example, is, so one-on-one -on -one meeting every week, you know, half an hour, 
with a, an all-star engineer. And this all-star engineer, we worked on a, a, an agenda, a standard agenda for the one-on-one -on -one discussions where it was framed in the, in the format of lessons learned. So it was like, tell me three things that went well this week. Tell me three things that went badly this week. Tell me one thing that you learned. And then what, what, are, we, what are we looking for? What three goals do we have for the upcoming week? And that, that promotes that discussion of experiential learning at least. Like, hey, this thing really went south on me, so we should approach it differently. Or we should take this lesson learned. The other thing that sets you up to do is when you have your team meetings, if you get anecdotes from your one-on-one -on -one meetings, you can feed those into the team meetings and say, hey, here's what we learned last week in, in the course of our actions. And, you know, so-and-so, uh, Daniel Sun, for the sake of um, the, the theme of the discussion, learned this thing last week. And so everybody, when you encounter that same thing, here's how, how not to react or how to react. You, what I'm saying is you make it part of the flow, part of the process, continuous reflection on how things recently went so that that it's it's kind of an agile approach toward the whole toward the whole question. Thank you. Anybody else? Sorry, I couldn't get myself to unmute. Um, I had a question, Brad. Um, yeah. How much of this? do you see as manager to managee, sorry. Um, and, and, and also like peer to peer as well, because, you know, I think events like things like this, I mean, it shows that, you know, it's not just about learning from your manager. It's learning from a peer that, that has a different background, a different skill set, And, and there's like that, like collective learning, you know, I, I learned from you, you learned from me, but, but where the, and I think we, everybody agrees with that, but where like the disconnect is, is like from like a, if, you know, if we're sitting there and I'm, and I'm developing uh, your development plan for the year, I'm not, I'm not saying, like, I'm not thinking like, well, how does, how do Brad and, and Randy leverage each other and kind of like combine their development plans? Have you, have you thought of it that way to, to, to kind of, to, to, to not make it just about the manager fostering that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's that's that can be done with the proper with with your arms properly wrapped around the situation of the peers in question and what their intentions are. That can be done. That can be done in terms of selecting teams. Um, selecting who works on what, and it, it's it's really it sounds like a lot of planning and organization work, but I think what if you really have if you're really and I think the key word is intent. If you're really intent on embedding development and embedding learning into day to day work, it starts to reveal itself quite a bit. And this, I've only been at CMU two months and I've already, I've already just because this is kind of, I'm, I'm my, my baseline state is to be aware and conscious of opportunities like this. I've already seen a massive, somebody that you know, Nate, but a massive opportunity with somebody who's very interested and very passionate about a certain thing. It's not his or her core job but it's an absolute need for the program. Mm -hmm. And even though it's outside that comfort zone, outside that job description, it's, it's the perfect match. And not only is, it, is this person passionate about this thing, this is the type of thing that helps that person progress to upper and upper levels. Like it's the type of opportunity that without, without marrying the, the intentional development process, then you, then it, it would have just been gone unnoticed, which is why, and, and not only that, but um, 
when you are either a manager or a peer, or it, this doesn't have to be managerial, if you're a peer of somebody and you know that a project is happening and you know that that person is interested in developing a skill or learning something new that's related to that project and it stumbles into your lap, you know, pass it on or, you know, you can do that through influence, I would say almost as easily as you can do it. And I've, I've seen it in many areas almost as easily. And it's really good when you have like a, a senior team member half mentoring a younger team member too, like knowing that, hey, I'm working on, I'm, I'm writing this, this program. And I know that this is something that you're, you're interested in. So come along, I'll do half of it and you're gonna do the other half, that type of thing. It happens all the time if you're on the lookout for it. Um, and kind of another, another way to, you, you kind of reminded me something that I skipped over that I think is absolutely critical when we look at assessing ourselves. And that is that, and this was the, this was the very first epiphany that I had for myself as I looked around and I see it every day at CMU. I, every time I go into a meeting with somebody, I'm looking at a, a screen full of faces that are more talented than me in at least one area, right? Some of those talents, I want, I want that talent. And this, this happened when I was young at Toyota, I observed this is I observed, for example, my direct manager was, he was the type of guy that had a way of interacting with me that made me want to run through walls for him. So observing that, observing that I don't presently have that, observing that that's something that I want, that's a skill that I, I want to advance to the next level. And I just want, because I realize this guy has it, this guy, he might, he actually did in this case, this guy had a lot of other problems and, but that, that's, that's not to knock him. He was, he was a, a great, arguably my greatest manager, um, but that there are a lot of them, but uh, he had this skill. And then the guy sitting next to him who I can still picture had a very different skill. He was extremely tenacious, but I looked at him and I said, I want to steal that skill. So that made it onto the list. And then looked around and like, this person's friendly. I, I'm not very friendly by nature. Um, you know, <laughs> th those things like- You're definitely not. <laughs> I, I, I literally, in early in my career, I tried to steal people's skills. I tried to observe them, break down what they did and put, put it into my game. Well, it's, it's an interesting point though, right? Like when you think like the question that you hate is what do you want to be in five years? Who knows? But like you have to have the self-awareness to know how you can improve where you are now to to maybe get maybe just where you want to be next year, not necessarily five. It's that self-awareness is so key. And then and then being like humble enough to say, I, I need to learn this skill set from somebody. Let me ask for help. Yeah. And, and because you can't know what situation will make itself available five years from now, you can have a broad enough set and a deep enough set of skills that you're prepared for whatever opportunity arises, like broadcasting out of your basement. Um, yeah. Exactly. I see Greg with a hand raised. Hey, yeah, so um, you have mentioned a lot about putting things on your list for personal growth and development. And there's a lot of agile kind of concepts here. Do you have a personal war room whiteboard information radiator thing? And like, what kind of stuff is on there with regards to your own personal development? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I don't, I'm not laughing at the question. I'm laughing at the obvious, obviousness of the yes. Um, <laughs> so the whenever I start a new job, it, this, this job is more difficult because I'm working at home. But the first thing I do is build a war room. So that, that's, that's how I... I surround myself with the data that I need to, to judge and to plan and to, to guide me so that I don't have to stop and think about it. Um, I mean, like I literally have, I have three whiteboard surfaces in this room alone. And um, let, in fact, I, I won't turn the camera because then I won't get it set back up correctly. But right now, just for my workout plans, I'm staring at a whiteboard 
that 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 has let's just say it's very well delineated and gridded um and like one of the things in assessing my five whys for time management one of the things i observed is since i'm working at home i will often run into obstacles like i want to take notes on something that i'm working on at work but i also want to take notes on how my workout was and how you know my my other effort to do x was and i noticed that if i try to keep them in separate notebooks i per, I, I generally prefer handwritten notebooks to to electronic and for this reason that i'll think about it while i'm in the office but my notebook is in the basement so the notes never get recorded so literally i developed a travel sack that goes with me upstairs and downstairs. And it so it doesn't give me that excuse to not document and not think about with intent tracking how things are operating. I mean, that's that's borderline crazy, but the, the point remains. Um, the I, I've one of the things I've been working on, especially this year, is setting up the environment so that when I'm at my laziest, I don't have a good excuse not to do something. But yeah, I, I, I keep as much, and even like right now in my, in my office upstairs, I have, I have the, I have as much war room as the space will allow. I have a three-year plan for the MSPM program up there. And I, I normally, in fact, I've been criticized that my diagrams can be, can become complex to the point that they're difficult for other people to read. So hopefully that's not the case tonight. <laughs> so as a, as a follow-up to that, and thanks for, thanks for sharing the backpack idea. That's good. Um, what's, what's like at the top, the most visible thing on your personal development information radiator? When you say visible thing, you mean the, the thing that I'm focused most on improving right now, or? Well, I, I presume you've got a shifting North star as you achieve one goal. Oh yeah. Another one, but how do you, how do you select what's at the top and in what format do you, do you show your progress? That fluctuates and here's, here's why that fluctuates. I, I'll, I'll give you the, the actual example right now is, um, I've been experiment. I mentioned time management is one that I'm working on right now. Specifically, I've observed with myself as the interviewee and the subject and the, the user, so to speak, I've observed that when I don't manage my time well, my sleep is the thing that suffers because I'll, I'll eat into it from the night and I'll eat into it from the morning. And then the rest of the day will be less effective per hour because I didn't get that sleep that was necessary. So um, one of the things that I'm doing when I look at what is causing that to break down is right now I'm in the middle of, uh, I'm in the midst of starting a new job where everything is new and everything is coming at me a hundred miles an hour. And to an extent, it's why I made such a point about empathizing with your situation. Like right now, in fact, to squeeze this in, in addition to the day-to-day -day things that are happening as we begin our semester, I pretty much, I won't say when I went to bed last night, but it, let's say it was this morning. Um, but but the, idea, the idea is I'm giving myself a little bit of grace because I'm trying to absorb so much all at once. And I know this is a temporary condition. So I'm, I'm tracking my specifically my bedtimes and my wake up times as the, the standard of success. But I also know that this is not a permanent condition under which I'm operating. So I'm, I'm, I'm not reacting aggressively when I don't hit the mark, let's say, because I know that I'm, 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 I'm in a temporary and very um, unusual, abnormal circumstance. And then like, I'm also at the same time doing research, like 
you can find research that says that the sleep trackers aren't very good. And like, I'm, 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 I'm experimenting with, with those, those processes as well. That's really interesting that it comes down to sleep for you. I, I empathize with that quite a bit. <laughs> I don't think we're alone. Any other questions? This was really good tonight, Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I hope it wasn't too obvious because every one of these concepts in isolation is obvious. But I, I think this it's it's important to go back and underline that I've tried a lot of different ways to interact with both myself and both my organization, and I found these to be sort of like to, to take, I think it's a Bruce Lee quote, like take what works and get rid of the rest. This is kind of the distilled version of a, a, a skeletal process that works. Yeah, that was great, really appreciate it. Thanks. So that concludes our first one of the year, yay. <laughs> Happy 2021. Hopefully nice. 2021 gets better as it goes. Hopefully we'll see some people in person this year too. Yeah, for sure. A um, couple, a couple last housekeeping things. So uh, as you've probably seen in the Zoom, we're recording. So we'll put this up on our YouTube channel and link to it from our LinkedIn group. Uh, that group once more is at producttankpittsburgh.com. So if you're not joined on that, just hit it. It redirects the LinkedIn page. Join up, you'll see posts. Um, yeah, I think it's about it. Nate, anything else? No, yeah, that's it. And we'll Great. do the next one the next month or two. Like Sean said at the beginning, if you want to present, we're doing lightning speakers next. If you have an interest in presenting 10 to 15 minutes in a lightning format, let us know. Hit us up through LinkedIn or the meetup, either way. Yeah, please. And it doesn't have to be a super themed, you know, uh, maybe it's just a problem you solve that's, that's of interest. All right. Thanks well, for your time, guys. Thank you, Brad. Much appreciated. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. See ya.